Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to be discussing the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So once we've moved on from Niels Bohr, where do we go? So it's going to be a bit of a complex video, I'm going to go through it as quickly as I can, but bear with me as much as you can. So we're going to start by looking at the problems with Bohr's model of the atom. Um, we're going to introduce the man named Erwin Schrödinger, um, famous for his Schrödinger's cat problem you may or may not have heard of. Um, and looking at introducing the features of the quantum mechanical model, which superseded Bohr's model. We're going to introduce the concepts of subshells and orbitals, and look at how we fill orbitals with electrons. Okay, so let's start. We've, we've so far been working with Bohr's model of the atom, the idea of um, electrons orbiting um, in, you know, in shells around the outside of a nucleus, which contains protons and neutrons, and that these electrons are defined particular orbits, you know, so a bit like planets moving around the sun. But Bohr's model had some problems. It was a useful explanation, and even, even today we often still think about it this way as a great um, complex um, but simplified kind of way to think about how the atom goes. I realise that it, you wouldn't necessarily think it's simple, but it's certainly simpler than the actual kind of more up-to-date model. So as a jumping-off point, we use it. Part of the reason it didn't work is, or d doesn't really work, or is a better explanation, is that it only really effectively worked for hydrogen. So atoms that have multiple electrons can't really be effectively explained by what Bohr um, put, laid out. And also, as we came to develop our understanding of particle physics and this idea we call quantum mechanics, a, a, a man named Werner Heisenberg developed um, what's called the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is essentially that for particles that are operating in this kind of space, in, in at the atomic kind of level, they're actually a lot weirder than we thought. I mean, that's a simpler way to put it. But this idea that saying for particles like electrons that are that small, that we can either know their position, or we can know their momentum, so how fast they're going and where they're going, but we can't know both things about an electron at the same time, because they're moving too fast. You either have to know where it is or how fast it's going. And so for Bohr's model, once this principle was developed, we saw that Bohr's model didn't actually, you couldn't, couldn't work with that, and so that we needed a newer explanation, because there was plenty of evidence that suggested that these ideas of quantum mechanics had a lot of merit in explaining atomic behaviour. And so along came a man, this man named Erwin Schrödinger. Okay, not there, there's lots of other scientists at, at this kind of point in history in physics developing ideas about um, the structure of the atom. So from he was born in 1887, died in 1961. So he's doing a lot of work in the 1920s, late 1910s, early 1920s. So he helped develop what we now call quantum theory or quantum mechanics, which is a, a, a way of trying to understand atomic behaviour in recognition that it's actually a lot weirder than we thought. And part of what he was using to help understand was using mathematical concepts and equations to try and describe the behaviour of things like electrons. And so some of the ideas are very out there. If you're interested um, in, you know, in looking it up, there's plenty that you can sink your teeth into. Um, but today we're going to focus on how his understanding, his ideas led to a new model of the atom. So we've introduced this idea that atoms and the particles inside them are much less ordered. Uh, they're not as ordered as we thought. They're much less predictable, and that being able, you know, that, that Bohr's model was was imagining, you know, the electrons being like planets orbiting around the sun. You know, when we're thinking about planets, we know where the planets are going to be in 10, 20 days, 20 years, 20, you know, 200 years time. Their orbits are very predictable and well understood. But electrons are not like that. And so thinking about them like that is not, it's, it's out of touch with reality. And so rather than actually saying, well, Instead of saying that electrons are really well-defined and well-understood, what then Schrödinger proposed was this idea of the quantum mechanical model, which we often call the le electron cloud model, that we have the nucleus at the centre, that rather than a defined place where electrons are, we can only really put a boundary around the physical space where they might be at any given moment. We can't pin them down, but we know that they've got to be somewhere within, within that. And so that knowing that, we can still then work with them and, and understand them, but we can recognise the reality that they're not as predictable as we had previously thought. Okay, so the idea is so it's basically like a probability area. You have a 100% chance of finding the electron somewhere inside that boundary, 0% outside of it, okay, but they're not actual defined orbits instead. So they kind of just look like this cloud of possibilities, okay? Um, 
And so then to try and make sense of well, where are the electrons in there? How can we think about where the, how the electrons behave? Then we have to kind of establish this new way of thinking. And so saying, all right, well, we've still got this concept of shells to, put, to, to work with. There's logic to that. It's just that they're not defined orbits like they used to be. And so what we say is that, all right, the electrons themselves are arranged in these things called subshells. So each shell is broken up into subshells that take up a certain physical shape. There's four main different types, S, P, D, and F. Now, I realise that it might be more logical to be like A, B, C, and D, but the idea is that they do have a, a, an origin in standing for something, but we don't need to go into that. But the idea, you can see some images here of kind of how we represent the shapes of these different types of subshells. S being really spherical, and then P, we've got three different versions. D has five versions, and so we'll get, get to that in a moment. But what we're saying is that these are the physical spaces where the electrons that fit in these subshells might be found. And so we call each of these types of places and arrangements an orbital. They orbit around the nucleus, but we, can, we say that each orbital contains two electrons only. Okay, so just so a pair of electrons, and we say that, all right, in order for those electrons to be considered to be paired up with each other, that they must be kind of moving in a way that's opposite. So we, we talk about them having spin. It's part of the physics of how we explain it. But that the spin of those electrons is in opposite directions. That's a way that we can try and account for the fact that electrons have the same electric charge. In order to be put together, there must be a stable way for that to work. And so each of these orbitals, you know, examples of which you're seeing here, contains one pair up to two electrons. Now, they might be empty, they might have one, or they might have two, depending on what the atom is. We'll get to that in a moment when we look at how they fill up. Okay, so an orbital is a physical space where a pair of electrons may exist, and that's the way of organising these subshells. Okay, so we refer to them by S, P, D, and F. Okay, as the label. So an S subshell can have up to only two electrons, and it has one orbital, so one pair. The P can have up to six electrons, that is because it has three orbitals. D can hold up to 10 because it has five orbitals, and F can hold up to 14 because it has seven orbitals. So it's just a way of saying, all right, well, physically, that this is the spot where they need to fit in order to accommodate that many electrons without breaking the universe, okay, to put it flippantly. All right, but so this idea of saying, all right, well, so each of these subshells can hold a specific number based on the fact that they've got a different number of orbitals. Now, each orbital, if I just go back for a second, each of these has a, a more specific kind of name, but we're not notation, we're not needing to go through that. But it's just so that we can help distinguish one from the other. Okay, so we've looked at this idea that orbitals can, tell, can hold pairs of electrons, um, and they take up a certain physical space where ele those electrons may be found, given that we can't pin them down. Now, the whole one of the benefits of this orbital way of thinking is that when we were looking at Bohr's model and starting to fill up the electron shells, that as you start to get bigger and bigger, that we start to notice a curious pattern. That we said that you know the first shell can hold two, and the second shell can hold eight, and the third shell can hold eighteen. But in the third shell, that we kind of get, we see atoms that fill up to eight electrons there, and seems to stop. You get to say potassium, where it's got two, eight, eight, and one. So we've actually gone on and started filling up the fourth shell, technically before the third shell is full. And so that doesn't really make sense based on the rules that we established, because we said that you start when it's empty, and then you go to the next shell, and you fill it till it's full, and then you move on. But now with this extra nuance of understanding about orbitals, that actually we can start to see there's, there's an underlying logic that's, that is being obeyed that supersedes Bohr's kind of pattern. And that is by looking at this diagram here. So one of, there's two kind of main, uh, main rules that we, we look at when we're trying to allocate electrons into a place, into orbitals. And it's called the Aufbau Principle and then Hund's Rule, named after the two physicists who kind of put them forward. So the first idea is that wherever, if we've got electrons to place, we fill the next lowest subshell first. So as we, we start at the bottom and we work our way up, always going to the next lowest rung. But as you can see, as we get further up, that going to the next lowest one means we start to actually kind of get out of sequence a little bit. You know, because we've got three goes here and here and here but then we can actually skip across to four before filling up there. I'll show you in a moment. What that now means is that actually that makes sense of why things like potassium, we've actually skipped, you know, we haven't filled in number three first before we go to number four. And then we come back and we start filling in number three till it's all the way done. And then we move on and we go on backwards and forwards. 
So we fill wherever there is the next available, next lowest one, we have to fill that one first. Once it's full, we move to the next row. And the second one is that each, each, so each of these lines represents an orbital. That's why the P has three, D has five, F has four, um, seven, and S only has one. And so what we do is we fill each orbital with one electron first. So each box has only one electron before we then start pairing them up. So we call this Hund's rule. Okay. Um, so where I've got P, these three P ones over here, for example, I start by putting one electron in each box on each line before I then start putting a second one. I can hold up to six, but I have them separate first, and then I start pairing them up. Once it's full, I move to the next one, and so on. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Okay, so we're going to do three examples. We're going to do um, we're going to do carbon, sodium, and then iron. I'm going to try and do it as quick as easy as we can. So, <clears throat> carbon has six electrons. So I'm going to represent each electron with an arrow, and I'm going to show that the arrows, the electrons have opposite spin by doing up arrows and down arrows. Okay? So the first two electrons will look like this. Okay? So I've got one up and one down. That's to show you that. So two electrons, I've got six to fill. So I need to find space for four more. So I go two, I put my next two there, so I've got four. And now I've got two more to put, to put so I'll do them there. You see how I separated those arrows? Okay, so I put one in each spot before I put them anywhere else. Okay, and now all my electrons are allocated. Okay, so I've got, that's where the electrons are for carbon. If I go to sodium, which is 11, I'm going to build on this six, I'm going to add five more. So what I'm going to do is I've got to, I've got to put another one here, and now I can start pairing these up. So I can, so I've, I've got two, four, I've got seven, I've got eight, nine, ten, but that means I've got one more electron, this is all full, so I've got to go to the next rung, and I put one. Now, it still fits with Bohr's model, because I've got, um, like in terms of the way we have done electron configurations, I've got two, I've got eight, and I've got one. But it's just now we can recognise that that eight here is actually kind of split into two smaller groups. Okay, and so now I'm going to go from sodium up to iron, which is 26. Okay, so I've got 11, I can fill up another one here to make 12. Okay, and then I can put in another 6 here. Okay, so it takes me up to 18. I can fit another 2 here. Um, so to make 20. And then I can then the next lowest one is to skip across to 3D over here. Now those ones have just come up for you. But so what I've got is like 20. I've put, put 1 in each box. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I've got to put 1 more. So now I start pairing. Okay, so I have 6 in this 3D. Okay, so what I have is I've got two, so so I've got two here, I've got eight, and then I've got all of these D electrons, and then I've got two in my fourth shell. All right, so that's kind of how you're know, thinking about it, how we've done in the past. But so what we can see is that each each time there is a consistent pattern in how these orbitals get filled up that we can use to help us to know where the electrons are going to go. This will be helpful when we start to we're going to, in a future video, look at how we can upgrade our understanding of electron configuration as a notation in light of this new knowledge. Okay, so if I list out all of the, the sets of orbitals, the little, the little groups here, I've only just done up to 7s, I haven't gone any further than that, because most elements aren't beyond that. But so the idea is what we can see is that, the, that we have a specific order. Now if I, I've arranged them like this for a reason. Okay, because I'm going to start drawing some diagonal arrows that will show the order that these will fill in. Okay, so I go 1s, 2s, then I fill 2p, then 3s, I fill up 3p, then 4s, I go back to 3d, then 4p, then 5s, and so on, and so on, and so on, as we go up. So there's a defined order as to how these things will fill up until they're full, and then we move on. Okay, so knowing that that is something that occurs, we can use that to our advantage in helping us to remember where the electrons are. Now, what we will also see as we're going to go a bit further forward is that seeing that where these electrons are and how those orbitals are does give rise to some of the behaviour of atoms of particular elements. Okay, but so we can remember this particular order, we can know how the electrons fill up and where they need to be put. Okay, so I know this has been a bit of a long one, thank you for your patience. But as you can understand, there's some deep ideas here to mull over. So we looked at the problems with the existing Bohr's model, particularly the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, in looking at that electrons are not well defined um, and really easy to find in the atom. They're much more chaotic than we thought, so we needed a new way of thinking. 
we introduced Erwin Schrödinger as a, a, a man who put forward this, what we call the electron cloud model or quantum mechanical model um, that defined electrons being in a probability, like a space that, of where we might find them rather than a well-defined location. We introduced the concepts of subshells and, and orbitals, the S, P, D and F. And then looked at the principles about filling up the orbitals with electrons. Now we know that this is kind of how they're arranged and the two kind of underlying ideas of the Aufbau principle and Hund's rule. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.